myself started my public career um, getting appointed uh, to a local board in San Francisco where I learned um, Robert's Rules of Order and Sunshine and um, you know, all the different meeting requirements in preparation for running for office. And it took a long time, uh, about eight years before I ran for my first office. And now in my fourth elected position as state treasurer, I understand how difficult it is for women uh, moving up the corporate ladder, um, moving up in politics and some of the traditional male dominated uh, fields. And so today, uh, thanks to Governor Brown, who signed SB 826, I believe, 826, uh, about two years ago uh, in September 2018, which mandated at least one woman on a corporate board if the company was headquartered here in California by a certain uh, date. Uh, we um, started, uh, number one, looking at the number of companies located in California and realized there were a lot of them that did not have a woman on their corporate board. Number two, we decided to see whether uh, women were interested in serving on a corporate board. And so we launched our women's registry uh, in 2019, early 2019, and got about 300 resumes. So we knew uh, that this was um, an interest to many women, but as we have heard, anecdotally, uh, people are cross-recruiting, meaning companies will have the same woman serving on different boards or their relatives of someone or friends of someone, and it's not really open to the general public. So it is kind of a secret club. And so today, uh, thanks to Charlotte uh, and 30% Coalition, we are going to try to demystify uh, how to get selected on a corporate board and some of the expectations once you're on a corporate board, because these boards are publicly traded uh, and they have different rules than most of us. I know I've sat on a lot of nonprofit boards and we don't have kind of that same uh, rules and regulations that are overseen by the SEC, for example. And so we are talking about a whole new set of rules that you need to abide by if you do want to apply to sit on a corporate board and hopefully we'll get selected. So I'm very happy to be here with, of uh, course, the 30% Coalition, uh, the LA, San Diego, and Northern California chapters of Women in Public Finance, 2020 Women on Board, the Sacramento Valley and California chapters of NABO, and California Women Lead for making today happen. This is gonna be the first in a number of uh, different webinars that we are gonna have. So we appreciate your feedback for those of you who are on after our presentation today in terms of how we can make it better for future webinars. Uh, and we will also be doing more outreach to as many folks as we can over the next couple months so that uh, we will have a nice pipeline of uh, women who are available so we don't have to hear, well, we couldn't find anyone qualified, right women? That's what we always hear. And we know we are out there. So thank you again, and I'm gonna turn it over to Charlotte. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you everyone for joining us. This is um, going to be a great uh, time together. We're expecting close to 600 uh, people. So I think that certainly the interest is there and I'm happy that we can all come together and, and work together because that's what it really is about. Um, just a word about the 30% Coalition to, to put this in context a bit. Um, the 30% the Coalition is an organization, a one-of-a-kind organization here in the U.S. that works on what we call the demand side. And forgive me for the economic terms, demand and supply, but you know, as Treasurer Ma said, the issue is not the number of women or the supply. And I think that, you know, the refrain that, oh, I would love to appoint a woman, I just can't find one, uh, is over. I think that, you know, no one accepts that anymore. What we at the coalition are trying to do, and when I say we, we have close to 100 member organizations, um, a large group of institutional investors representing 6 trillion in assets under management. 
And we are pushing companies and influencing them collaboratively as investors can do best to open their boardroom doors to diverse candidates, women and people of color. We have a very um, intense program that we engage in every year with companies. And to date we have 400 companies that have appointed a woman to their board for the very first time in their history. So we have a long way to go, but we're making progress. The other side of the coin, obviously, is that as we create demand, we, we really do need to fuel that pipeline. Um, Treasurer Ma mentioned public companies, but there is also a huge demand in private equity. Uh, we have a large group of private equity within the coalition, and they are looking to diversify their portfolio boards. So in addition to certainly in California, where the um, environment is fertile uh, for, for finding a board seat, probably more than anywhere else in the country, we also have a private equity um, landscape, if you will, that are also searching for women. So as Treasurer Ma said, we're here today to, to share with you about you know, how to approach this. My understanding is that many of you are very experienced. Uh, many of you are starting at the beginning. So, you know, we're trying to address all of that. We're certainly open to questions. And we have um, three women who, who I think are experts in their field and can really, I think, shed some light on how to approach this. So before we get started with the panel, I'd like to just go around and have each uh, panelists introduce themselves. Amy, we'll start with you. You're the right hand of my screen. Um, and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got to be here today. Thank you, Charlotte. I had to take myself off mute. Uh, I'm an executive coach and a former global Fortune 50 executive team member in multiple areas. I worked for large companies like McKesson and Allianz and Chief Human Resource Officer and Chief Administrative Officer and Compliance Officer roles. I'm an attorney and, um, gosh, I got my law degree at Georgetown and I write um, and teach at Stanford and UC Berkeley Haas. And I'm a fellow at the Harvard Institute of Coaching and I do a lot in the space of workplace culture and corporate governance and effective leadership. And so, and I testified for the bill. I was pleased to partner with Betsy and had the privilege of working with an amazing group of women in Nabo um, to get the bill passed here. And then also I worked on the um, state legislation in Washington was recently passed, Washington State. So thank you for having me. Pleasure. Katie? Uh, good afternoon, Charlotte. Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, so I'm a managing director with Piper Sandler & Co. Uh, my primary career is uh, public finance investment banking here in California. And I recently landed my first independent director role on the board of a small emerging growth publicly traded company on the NASDAQ exchange. Um, that occurred uh, late in 2019 after about a year search. Uh, the company itself specializes in the design, manufacturing and sales of DC power systems and um, provides low cost backup power applications. Um, I'm also a member of both the audit and nominations and governance committees for that company. And I have also served on a number of industry and nonprofit boards throughout my career, as well as um, working with and advising to governing boards over my 25 year career in public finance. Great, thank you. And my good friend, Betsy Burkheimer for there. Well, thank you, Charlotte, and hello, everybody. I'm in California, too, in Los Angeles, and I'm the CEO of 2020 Women on Boards, which is an education and advocacy, public awareness campaign, not a membership organization, but a campaign. And we have 30 city events throughout the country and, and globally, London, Mexico City, Spain, and Zurich as well, in order to advance the knowledge of women on how to get themselves onto corporate boards and to advocate with companies to advance women to corporate boards. Research shows, uh, and independent research from Credit Suisse and from McKinsey and KPMG, uh, talking about the business advantages of having women on boards. So, and especially three women, which is our, our target goal. I'm also CEO of a retained executive search firm in Los Angeles and I've written two books on the subject that you'll hear about. And I also am the originator, I'm proud to say the achievement of my life, 
uh, with many other partners to get this done, but the originator of the California law, SB 826, which since Women's Equality Day is coming up, the bill was named for August 26, 826, in honor of the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote, the 19th Amendment, which in the 100th anniversary is just about 10 days away. So um, I'm proud that we, we did this and it took seven years, women and men, seven years to get that bill passed. People in the other parts of the country, especially New York, oh, they say those, those wacky people in California, they just overnight got that bill passed and what an irritant it is to uh, companies throughout the country. But uh, it's not the case, it took a long, long time and it was actually a conquest as opposed to a campaign. But can't wait to tell you more about that and uh, delighted to be here. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, well, before we get started, and I do want you to uh, talk a little bit more about that, obviously. Um, one of the things that, uh, that the treasurer said that, that I would like to, to comment on, and the answer actually to one of the questions that I received prior to, to the webinar is, um, what are the sectors and the companies in California that are, um, that are looking for women? Uh, and I think the answer to that is all of them. <laughs> uh, we, uh, because they have to, um, you know, the 30% coalition is honored and thrilled to be working with the treasurer and her staff on this. And I'm hoping that we can, you know, take what we're doing here and expand it uh, throughout the country and the world in a way, because I do think that it's so important for us, us women um, to, have a seat at the table. I mean, we, we've been a long time coming. So Betsy, to, to pick up on that theme, uh, and you mentioned that you were one of the initial um, movers of the, of the legislation, uh -huh. uh, I think through the National Association of Women Business Owners. Can you give us a little bit of background about how you, how you all, and I know that you were working with some legislators, uh, how you all thought of this, how you got there, uh, and, and really some color about, about what it means even going forward, because I think there is even a new legislation on the table that maybe you can share with us about uh, diversity in the boardroom. So mm -hmm. let me turn that over to you and you take us through it. Well, do I have two hours to talk about that? Or No, you have <laughs> about briefly two highlights. Very brief highlights. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll try not to cover the whole seven years. I want you to talk about other things too. <laughs> uh, but it was um, uh, seven years ago, meaning it was 2012 when, when a group of NAWBO members, National Association of Women Business Owners here in California, and I knowing from the executive search business uh, that uh, this is an area that we really needed to focus on to get more women on corporate boards because there weren't Back then, even the numbers were about 12% of board of board members uh, in the whole country being uh, uh, women, and now the number, of course, is uh, we passed 20% this last year in 2019 nationwide, and in California, we're at 21.7% of all of the board seats in the state are held by women, and we expect a, a significant uptick in that when when the figures for 2020 are reported, but. Uh, it, it started on a, on a uh, I'd like to say, a, it wasn't a cocktail napkin, it was a coffee napkin saying that, you know, back in 2006, Nor the country of Norway and then the country of Sweden passed a mandate for their whole country saying that they had to have 40% women on their corporate boards, which was just unheard of. And then uh, a few years later, uh, the, uh, France passed a 40% um, um, mandate and then in 2015, Germany, which was the biggest economy uh, in, in Europe and, and one of the largest in the world, passed, passed the mandate uh, for 40%, or 30%, I'm sorry, <clears throat> thanks to Chancellor Angela Merkel. So we thought, well, here in California, we should be able to also have uh, some kind of mandate. We're the seventh largest, um, if not the fifth, sorry, largest economy in the world. And we lead the country in everything else. So should we try this? And so we did try to. And I wrote the, the, uh, the, the law 
I, I'm not a lawyer and I'm a total amateur about this, but wrote uh, all the background and why we, this is a business issue. This is not an equal representation issue. It's a business issue because companies perform better when women are on boards and, uh, and it's proven. So we took that to the government and uh, to the Women's Caucus primarily, State Senator Hannah Jackson really took up the, the torch and led the whole effort. First, we had to get a resolution for three years in order to prove that the needle wasn't going to move just by urging companies to uh, to comply, but uh, nobody did. And and, and the previously the, the uh, boards don't want women on their boards. They just don't want to bother with taking on additional, perhaps strangers, uh, into their into their collegial uh, environment. So the the needle didn't move when there was no penalty. That gave us the background to go after a law because the difference is the law has a penalty and it's a stiff one uh, requiring that uh, if a company, public company did not have a, one woman on its board in the year 2019, that the company would be fined by the Secretary of State, be fined $100,000. Uh, and then the next part of the law, which is the deadline coming up about uh, 16 months from now, is uh, end of 2021, the requirement is a minimum of three women on every public company board. And the penalty is still $100,000 per woman per year. So a company that didn't put on three women by the end of 2021 could be uh, fined up to $900,000. That started to get people's attention. And therefore, as a result, and this was the, the big news, that 200 women got onto new board seats in the state of California last year, 2019. So many that the, there are only six companies remaining in the state of California of the Russell 3000 that don't have any uh, women on, on their boards. And soon they will because bad PR will follow them. <laughs> and interestingly enough, one of the pushes by the legislature, uh, legislators against us, against our effort, and after, uh, as, as Amy recalls, we, we testified six different times, six different committees over the year 2017 to get this, in 2018 to get it passed by, uh, by September. Uh, and all the pushback was, well, companies will leave the state of California if you have to, if you make them put women on the boards, they'll leave. They just won't put up with this. Well, four companies did leave, but it turns out that only one of them was a, a company that had no woman. The others uh, had women on their board and they left anyway. I'm not sure why. Anyway, the companies didn't leave, but can you imagine that they would say that, that the companies are gonna leave? And they also said, of course, there aren't enough uh, qualified women to serve on the corporate boards. And uh, they had a few other arguments as well. but. We made it through and we, we, we got the votes. We thought we were never going to win. We thought time and time again, we were never going to win, but we kept at it. And like everybody on this call knows, as long as you keep gently or not so gently pushing, 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 uh, we eventually made it because we had legions of women and women business owners and companies uh, going to Sacramento at our own expense to testify to visit with legislators and, and point out the business reasons, the economic reasons that this made sense. Because just having re representation of, of women, it, it, that's, not, that's not a business reason. So uh, we pointed out how shareholders, as well as employees, customers, and the company's bottom line would improve. Anyway, then we finally got the passed by both houses, the Senate and the Assembly in uh, in August, August 30th of 2018, and it took the governor a whole month. This is Governor uh, Jerry Brown. We couldn't believe it took so long. And then it, for, he had to sign it in order to make it official or veto it. And he finally signed it on the last possible day. And it happened to be during the, the Kavanaugh hearings in Washington, D.C. And he even sent a note to the, the, uh, the, the Judiciary Committee in Washington, D.C. to say, this is how we do it in California. Clearly women have been left out of the whole decision-making process and uh, we're making a change in California. I still have the pen with which he signed the, uh, the legislation. So it, I, get, I get choked up just about every time I talk about it, but we're so proud and that's why we want to educate women. All of you who are listening to this webinar 
on how to get yourselves on corporate boards because no one else will do it but you, but you can do it. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that in a bit. There's one thing I'd like to just point out um, that when we talk about women, I know certainly me and at the coalition when we, 10 years ago when we, when we founded the coalition, we have always included women of color. But I think that's not so obvious. Um, and, you know, certainly the coalition, our vision is that the boardroom doesn't go from an all white male board to an all white female board. Right. Um, the coalition has recently, we changed our mission, refined our mission uh, to read that we advocate for corporate board diversity, promoting women and people of color. Uh, that also opens the door to men, but that's another mm -hmm. conversation that we'll have another time. I mean, we have a lot of challenges because of disclosure. But where I'm going is that there is now another bill, as far as I know, at, in the California legislature True. that is requiring companies to disclose the diversity of their board. Um, and can you can you highlight that just a little bit about what's going on? Because I do think that women of color, we, we did a campaign last year within the coalition and I found um, much to my disappointment, heavy disappointment that women represent 24% of S&P 1500 and women of color represent three and a half, which for me is totally unacceptable. So, you know, we're trying, we at the coalition are really trying to embrace that, support that and encourage that. Can you talk a little bit about the law here in California, or there in California, I'm not there, um, that, that addresses that, and then we'll move on to someone else. Absolutely. The law in California, SB 826, refers to the whole gender of women, women of all ethnic and racial background. And uh, we gender, the, our gender of women is the gender that's uh, underserved and has the fewest number of, 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 of board members, of course. And you are correct, Charlotte, the number of women of color is even lower. And it's similar to your percentages across the board. So uh, our efforts, 2020 Women on Boards, my organization, uh, nonprofit, is to, um, as you are doing, reach out to a broad and robust um, and network of women of color in order to uh, engage with them and make sure that they are part of our education efforts to uh, share with them how to get themselves on boards, especially now. So the, the bill that's in front of the California legislature, it, it copied ours completely, but changed um, with, the, with the penalties in, in, as the same and the years the same, but uh, added people of color, women and men. And so we applaud that effort in that uh, what we think that will be, what will mean, will be more women of color in California, as well as you know, influencing the rest of the country, more women of color, because women of color will check two boxes. She'll be a woman and a person of color. And I think that that will, will really uh, meet what our, what our goals are. We love men, but even, even, even minority men have a better chance of getting on boards than minority women. So it's important for us to be engaging all the women and making sure that uh, our gender is represented across the board. Great. Um, and, and I think that we all, um, so I just, your mind would like to. I just wanted to add that that assembly bill is 979 by assembly member Holden and I will type it in the chat. Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, and there, you know, there is, there's legislation across the US um, asking companies to disclose the um, <clears throat> gender, racial, and ethnic diversity, which I think is, is the first step. I think we, if we don't know what it is, we can't measure it. I don't want to get off track here, but I do just want to emphasize that, you know, this is an inclusive conversation. It is about California, but it's also about the United States of America, and it is about all citizens and not just <laughs> not just the white women you see on this screen besides uh, Fiona. So I, I think that's important that, that we emphasize that, that you know, we're all working together. So um, turning to um, Amy, actually, I think it would be a good idea to just give our audience um, an idea about what is a public company board? 
you know, what are the governance principles surrounding it, um, the purpose of the board, et cetera. And maybe you could work this question that we just got into, what are the financial requirements of board and the equity positions, which um, I think we're talking, we're, you know, you can address that. There, there's public company boards, there's venture capital, and there's private equity boards. And maybe you could um, touch on that at a high level as you're talking about governance. Great. Well, why don't we, since we have, I think, probably a variety of experience um, on the uh, on the call, I'm going to start at the beginning. Okay. To give us a good baseline before jumping in too deep. So a board of directors is an elected group of individuals, and they represent the shareholders. And the board is a governing body that sets policies and it oversees corporate management in a corporation. And the board's responsible ultimately for protecting investors' interests. And every public company must have a board. Um, many private companies and nonprofit organizations also have boards. And so the main responsibilities of a corporate board are to hire, manage, and terminate the CEO. That's, that's really ultimately their number one job. They're also responsible for compensation and incentive plans for senior executives, the management team of the organization, and they have to ensure that financial resources are available. They approve annual budgets, company financials, and they guide the CEO and senior management regarding strategic major decisions. And they're expected to bring their network and their skills and expertise to fulfilling those responsibilities. Um, one of my favorite sayings around the role of the board versus management, which is really important if you've been an executive and then you're moving on to a board because the roles are very different, is nose is in, fingers out, which relates to the fact that boards have the power to demand the data and ask the questions and they're under a fiduciary duty to do so, but they are not responsible and they're expected specifically not to get in the weeds. Um, that is the CEO's job. So they hold the CEO accountable, um, but they respect the boundaries of their role. Now, the board has a range um, of, of number of members. I would say, you know, anywhere from seven to 12. The data, I think Betsy is, is the average is about eight for the Russell 3000. Um, some have as few as four, which I wouldn't recommend. Um, that's not really enough in my opinion. And some have around 30 and I've been on some nonprofit boards that have 30, but that's because only 20% of the people do the work. So different, uh, different structure there. <laughs> I, see, I see Katie's with me on that. Um, so people, uh, let's see, boards meet monthly uh, in large organizations. They have to, because there's just too many decisions that have to, so like a McKesson board, you know, a hundred and, you know, $50 billion organization is going to meet monthly. Smaller companies might meet, you know, maybe a minimum of four times a year. Plus you have committee meetings. Um, the chairman of the board or chair directs and facilitates the meetings. They determine uh, the board compensation, oversee that and management responsibilities, and then they help develop the effectiveness of the board. And in some corporations, the CEO also serves as chairman, um, but that's come under some fire lately with, with good cause. Um, that can lead to a lack of governance and some conflicts of interest. So most large companies do not um, conflate those, those two roles. Um, so with regard to the investment, I might need to defer Charlotte a little bit to someone else on the panel around this. The boards that, I'm a, that I've been involved with, the large public boards, don't necessarily require a large equity upfront. I think those are more companies that have maybe just been post IPO um, or are trying to go IPO and they require um, some combination of an equity investment along with the time. But the boards that I've been involved with and done compensation for um, you get a certain uh, cash compensation plus equity shares, and then uh, you do get taxed. And so most people that I have worked with say that you know sometimes their their cash compensation for the first year they wind up paying so much in taxes for the for the equity the second year that it kind of you know zeroes out. So it's more of a of a long term um, relationship and, and financial package, I would say, but I'd love to hear what other people on our panel think. I can address the, the, the you know, the global market um, as best I can. I, I actually come from the corporate world before I started doing this and I was in the capital markets uh, arena. So a public company board um, pays you to be on the board. 
I mean, as Amy said, there may be some expenses in the first year that but you end up paying taxes on what you get. But you know, the, the range of the compensation obviously is um, attached to the size of the company. You know, we often hear of somebody making millions, but they're on like the, I don't know, some of these mega cap companies. Yeah. Um, but there, there is, you know, compensation there, it's a stipend. Um, the travel expenses, et cetera, are reimbursed. Um, in the private equity world, uh, it's about the same. I mean, there, and we're doing a lot of work with private equity pension. So, you know, there is a salary, uh, there is equity, which is probably faster coming than on a public company board. Uh, there may be some, I mean, Katie, jump in here. You, you are, you know, on, on these boards. Um, I think that the, the, the um, circumstances where a board member would have to make a contribution would be more in the venture capital space where, and I, you know, unless you are an investor uh, or an angel investor, et cetera, I would advise staying away from that. Uh, you should not have to pay to be on a board. Uh, there are some large um, nonprofit boards, particularly universities and, and these kind of things that also require um, a, a donation in order to serve on the board. But what we're talking about today is um, them paying you <laughs> for your time and your expertise uh, in order to provide oversight. And, and Charlotte, maybe just to add, um, to, to, to quantify that a bit, um, you know, I did a lot of research on this during, during my search process. And um, if I remember correctly, I think, uh, you know, to bookend it on the, the high end uh, S&P 500 boards, um, maybe the compensation is 300,000 on average for a new director with roughly a third of that in cash and two thirds of that in stock. Um, and then on the low end for the, the small cap companies, uh, the emerging companies, it could be as little as 20,000. Um, and in some cases there isn't any stock offered in a smaller company. Um, so, you know, I think unless you're, uh, you know, you've got a lot of experience and you've been on a lot of these boards and you're in a, a top tier company, you're not going to get rich by serving on a board and it should never be sort of your first reason for wanting to serve. Right. Um, however, I do think it's a nice second career path, which is why, Absolutely. Um, you know, we have so many people on this call, actually. <laughs> um, but let's talk a little bit, Katie, about, you know, your experience. You are on a public company board. You actually serve on the nominating committee as well as the audit committee. Can you talk a little bit about how a board goes through that search process and the actual nomination of a candidate? Yeah, and maybe sure. maybe what they should be doing and what they actually are doing because <laughs> I think there's two different two different yeah, pathways here definitely and may, maybe uh, again because there's uh, people at all ranges of their career here and uh, maybe some have been on boards before and some haven't um, I'll, I'll kind of start at the basics um, and talk a little bit about the differences uh, the way that uh, board members are brought in depending on the type of board that uh, that you're looking at. There's really three basic types. We've talked about them. There's the public uh, large corporation traded on an exchange, which is really our focus here. There's the private company, and then there's nonprofits. And um, when you look at the public large corporations, you know that the information on those types of companies is, are uh, easily accessible. They are most likely to use a search firm as part of their process to find candidates. Although um, I do believe that, you know, in excess of 50% of their hires do still come from personal recommendations, um, in particular from other board members. Uh, there are variations within public corporations. You have your large Fortune 500s. Uh, they typically will look for you. Um, and then you have sort of the next tier down, the large cap. Uh, they will typically have a formal process that does include their nominations committee and the nominations committee is there really to screen what a search firm has provided as far as candidates and then also to look through referrals. 
And then when you get down to the small to mid cap, they really use a variety of sourcing, um, including boutique uh, research firms, um, recommendations from other board members, and, and also they'll look to uh, their relationships, general counsel, investment bankers that they may have had uh, during uh, their funding process, et cetera. Um, when you're looking at private companies, uh, information on those types of firms is typically a little bit more difficult to get. Uh, directors there are going to be more likely recommended through a personal network. Um, there are variations within the private companies as well. There's private equity and there's privately held companies. With private equity, um, they are typically companies that have a particular view in the market. So they may have several different boards um, depending on the investments for those private equity firms and each board is primarily made up invest of investors. So typically what will happen there is pre IPO, they start to look for an independent director that has some type of functional expertise that they're looking for. Um, and you would generally be introduced through individuals that are already within that private equity firm. If it's a uh, privately held company, um, these can sometimes be very large and very interesting companies in, in my mind. And uh, oftentimes we'll need outside expertise. Um, sometimes they need audit expertise. Sometimes they're expanding their business into a foreign country. So they may need somebody with that type of experience. But generally it's gonna be a personal referral and you have to be in the network to get recommended. And then, and finally nonprofit and uh, specific to nonprofits where you get compensated, and there's really, I think, three uh, areas of nonprofits. There's academia, which I think, Charlotte, you mentioned earlier, the large universities. There's foundations, and then there's healthcare. And um, these are almost exclusively by referral. Um, although I personally know a number of individuals who have um, been offered director positions after having served either pro bono. Um, on a committee for the nonprofit or, or uh, possibly as an advisor to the non nonprofit. Um, I also uh, will add that uh, one of the companies that I interviewed with uh, my competition was another woman uh, who had acted as an advisor to, the to that particular company for many years and she ended up um, getting the position. So uh, being an advisor to a company that, that has a need or a gap is always um, helpful. In any case, um, boards are always gonna be looking for and judging candidates based on some um, key qualities that are necessary for the role. Um, I, I think later in, the, in this discussion, we're gonna talk about gaps that may be on boards and, um, and how they fill those gaps. So I'm gonna talk maybe a little bit about um, some of the soft skills that I think uh, the nominations committees are specifically looking for. Uh, one very important one is going to be collegiality. Uh, they're looking for individuals who have the ability to work within a team of really bright people and still be able to find common ground. Um, they're going to be looking for directors who know what their role as a director is and, and has some empathy uh, frankly, towards the CEO and towards management. Again, uh, noses in, fingers out. Um, they don't want someone who's going to come in and try and out CEO the CEO. I think um, more recently, uh, boards are looking for directors that have a, a resilient perspective, given what's been going on. Uh, they really aren't looking for people who are naysayers and critiques. They're, they're focused on directors who have a viewpoint focused on opportunities and vision. Um, and certainly as you're going through the interview process, you're going to want to uh, be able to show uh, that uh, during the discussion. Um, a lot of boards are looking for cachet. They, they want their members to be well recognized so that they bring um, dare I say it, an element of stardom or credibility to their company. Um, that's obviously going to be more significant with the larger and more visible companies. Um, but, you know, it does run throughout nonprofits. That's very important because they want their directors to be out there raising money as well. Uh, they also want their directors to have valuable relationships and be influencers. Um, 
you're going to be expected, regardless of the type of board you're on, to be able to open the right doors for the company. Um, they want to know that once you're selected, that you know who to call and how to get things done through your networks. And that is particular when it comes down to trying to find funding. And then um, finally, I think skilled governance and a strategic perspective are important. Um, a large portion of the role is uh, strategic policy decisions that are made by the board and uh, each board member is expected to contribute there. Um, and uh, I, I have another quote that uh, kind of runs in line with what Amy said, but, but the one I like is, uh, your role is to pick the coach, define the plays, and stay off the field. And, uh, and so if you can display those qualities, um, you've got a good chance of being selected. Um, I will say that also that in the case of nonprofit boards, um, these boards are gonna be looking for folks that have a particular passion for the mission of the board and also, of course, the monetary contributions and being able to raise money from other sources. So, and, and I, I think finally, you know, when you get to the interview process itself, you know, you'll, be, you'll be vetted through the nominations committee and uh, they may have you know, two or three candidates that they decide to interview. The interview may be formal, it may be informal. Um, in this case, if you get to that stage, you know, they've really identified that you have the background and the skills necessary. This is really more about cultural fit and, and how do you show up um, in the position as a director. Um, you need to demonstrate an ability to um, fit in interpersonally while still standing out with your skills. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think that um, while CEOs tend to be the ones that are hired most often for directors um, and boards seem to be looking for that role uh, majority of the time, that it's oftentimes the C-suite leaders and the vertical managers who um, demonstrate this a little more easily because in their day-to-day -day roles, they are working within a team and um, having to uh, come up with um, conclusions and to uh, compromise, et cetera, whereas a CEO isn't necessarily um, used to doing that. So, so when you get to the interview process, um, obviously there's going to be questions that go back and forth. You should always come prepared to, to ask questions of the committee as well. Um, a great candidate's going to show curiosity and enthusiasm for where the organization is going, but you're also going to have to demonstrate your knowledge of the organization, uh, what the strategy is, and, um, and ask them about, you know, what is the company's next steps. Um, and again, kind of going back to a theme we had before, you need to understand your role as board member, um, ask questions about strategy, capital allocation, uh, you know, are there, is there resistance to meeting the goals of the strategy, et cetera. And then I guess finally is just, um, you need to, to approach it like it's a job interview. Uh, and you need to make sure the company and the board is the right fit for you because as we mentioned earlier, the terms are long. Um, four to seven or eight years and um, you need to make sure that you're up for the challenge and that that's the right fit. It's a really long time to sit in a room with folks if you don't like them or you don't like the company and um, you know it's very very difficult to resign from a board in a professional manner that doesn't impact either part or parties negatively. So uh, really important up front to make sure that it's a good fit and um, sometimes that can be um, a challenge when you're looking for your first role, but, um, you know, I think you'd be well served uh, if, if you're feeling uh, that it's not a fit uh, to, to pass up that one and, and move on to the next one. That's good advice. Uh, before we turn to Betsy to tell us how to do this, <laughs> um, and she's got some great steps and programs, I, a couple of remarks, um, and I'd also like to turn to Amy, but the first remark I'd like to make is I think that, you know, at the heart of Treasurer Vaughn's initiative here, and I think she references at the very beginning of, of the conversation, is that today there, there's overboarding. What happens is that, you know, or what has happened, let's hope that it's changing, um, executive recruiters will be, in, you know, be engaged by a company 
and they will go to proxy statements to try to find those women who are already serving on boards. But safe for them, I understand it. But what happens is you have the same women serving on four or five boards, and it it blocks the opportunity for everybody else, number one, and number two, I don't think it's good governance. So I think that this initiative is an answer to that, and we have it across the country. Another another initiative is 2020 Women on Boards, which Betsy is gonna talk about in a second. But before we get there, I'd like to just take a minute. You talked, Katie, about soft skills. Um, and Amy, maybe, you know, we were talking about governance, what boards are, et cetera. What are, beyond being a CEO, which is obviously not even realistic because it's a handful of women CEOs in the US, and I think that the trend is away from that. I mean, investors certainly are pushing up against that. Everybody does not have to be a CEO. But what what hard skills do you need to serve on a board, Amy? And, and if you don't have them, what should you start doing uh, at this point? Yes, well, a certain level of financial expertise is required, to Katie's point. You need to be able to uh, read the financials, sign off on them, and participate in that way. And that's why traditionally I would say boards have looked at prior CEOs and CFOs significantly um, for, for their expertise. Um, other common subject matter areas, depending on the maturity and business strat plan of companies have in the past included sales, strategic planning, marketing, legal, there's almost always one lawyer, one former auditor on the board with, with good reason, and um, sometimes HR. But boards are definitely looking more broadly, and as someone who's been an expert in corporate ethics and governance and risk management, um, you know, there's a lot of good cause for that. The Women on Boards movement has shown a spotlight on the business need to have greater diversity of skills and experience that women bring on boards, including decision-making styles, network, different networks, that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, the pressure from institutional investors um, has created a greater awareness and push. And so particularly right now, I would say diversity, equity, and inclusion. So DEI, experience in that, which usually comes if you've been an HR executive. Um, risk management. So if you've been in compliance, risk audit, um, ERM, ESG, um, CSR, those kinds of skills can be extremely important right now when supply chain and um, international issues are being challenged with regard to business models and shifts. Um, cybersecurity, data privacy um, has been huge, and then human capital management. And part of this also, of course, is because companies need to know how to, they've been kind of caught a lot of them on their back foot with Me Too and Time's Up and Black Lives Matter, and customers and institutional investors are, are demanding a response both to how they're treating their workforce as well as who comprises their executive team and then board. Um, so one thing I would mention, Charlotte, because I had, I had done a board session for California Women Lead, which is a lot of women I'm guessing on this call have significant public service experience. Um, and as Betsy's excellent um, board book, uh, The Board Game, which is one of my favorites on, on boards, mentioned she has a wonderful chapter in there around how do you transition and leverage your public service experience into a board seat potentially. And so um, what I know Betsy and I both share a lot with people is, you know, it can be an effective springboard to board service, especially if you've had large budget management, personnel management, and regulatory experience or experience in the media because they want you to be a known quantity. So um, I, would, I would think right now, a board search can take up to 10 years and it's not something you just flip the light on and say, oh, I feel like being a board member now that I'm, you know, 50, 55. It's, it's because you've been building your career and your relationships and your network over time. Um, so I'm thrilled that we have so many people on, on uh, our call right now because it's, it's really never too early to start preparing and thinking down the line, what are my gaps? What do I need to be working on? How can I get that skills and experience? Things like serving on a nonprofit board and being the head of, of the finance um, or, or fundraising or capital campaign can be an excellent way to begin getting that finance experience if you're not getting it in your day job. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, one of the things that we're finding, because our investors, we're working closely with companies about the competencies, the assessment of the board, because I'm, I'm imagining in today's world, 
many of the boards, and Katie, maybe you can weigh in here, many of the boards are scrambling because the markets have totally changed. We're not really sure where they're going. Um, and I think that the board needs to be able to handle that and assess that and make decisions about the company going forward. So let's say, Katie, I'm a 45-year-old woman. Um, and, you know, I think well, certainly when I was 45, I never thought about that. I was too busy taking care of my children and whatever we do at 45. Um, but, you know, let's say that I am thinking about that. And I have a, I'm in a progressive company who will, quote, help me. Uh, what should I do? What, what are some of the steps that I can take at 45 to be able, and I'm not saying you have to be 45, obviously you can start at any age, but what are some of the preparatory steps that you can take within a company that would prepare you for that day when you finally decide, okay, my network is here, et cetera, I want to go for this? Um, so what, what is your advice? It's, you know, it's a really good question. Um, and I would say that, you know, really, this, this can seem uh, sometimes like a very overwhelming process. And um, so I would say the first thing you really need to do before you even get to your question is you need to do um, a self-assessment. You know, are you ready for the process? Uh, you need to, if you, if you determine you are ready, you need to narrow down your choices and then you have to have a plan of attack. So, um, you know, when going through my own self-assessment, I really started to think about, you know, the why, when, which of, of serving on a corporate board. And, um, you know, for instance, uh, why? Um, other, other than the paycheck or, you know, doing it after retirement, being that it's such a significant, significant time commitment, um, and I had my full-time job, which was also a significant time commitment. What was it that really was, um, was telling me, you know, this was something that I wanted to seek. Um, and I really think it boils down to, to, to a number of different things. You know, I think you have to have this call to service. Um, you know, many people do it because there's, um, there's some initiative that re resonates with them that they want to support or, you know, for the intellectual challenge, you know, going beyond your, your existing network of, um, of your specific career, or your specific industry. I, for me, it allowed me to express my leadership skills outside of my chosen career. Um, but once you decide, you know, you want to do it, um, the next question is when? I mean, I, I'm sure there are a lot of women on this call that are in their 30s and, um, and they think they're ready now and, uh, and they want to move forward. And, um, and, you know, I say, go, go for it. <laughs> um, but there are some good reasons and some good things that you need to consider before you take this on, because not only is the process long and arduous, um, but once you get on a board, there, it's a, a very large time commitment. So um, you might want to think about, you know, are you, an, do you have a stable, predictable family life? Do you have folks uh, in your family who are going to support the time commitment that you're putting in for, for your passion? Um, are you financially stable? And, and probably the most important um, for directors, I think, is have you really achieved enough not to feel like you need to prove yourself in the boardroom? Um, because again, that's not really the role of a director. And, and then you've got to sort of narrow it down. You know, well, which kind of board do you want to, um, to serve on? Uh, and, you know, we've gone through several times now the types of, of boards uh, and, and what they're made up of. But each one also has a particular uh, a feel to it or particular issues that they spend more time on. Uh, privately held equity, you know, they're looking for more opportunities to improve risk management versus a mature public firm that really leaves, needs life cycle management experience. So, you know, you, you have to kind of do some of that private work first um, to determine how to establish your plan of attack. Um, and I would say for your first board role, it's probably best to, to focus on the smaller or the privately held companies because they're just going to be a lot easier to get on than a, than a large public company um, or serve on a nonprofit and work in a, as an advisor early on. But if you're looking specifically within your company and how you can develop the, that uh, experience, I, I would definitely say look for different leadership roles within your existing company. Um, 
you know, uh, I think you're going to want to try and find roles that have P&L responsibility. Um, oftentimes, they tell people who want to become CEOs that what you want to do is you, if you have the opportunity, is take laterals uh, so that you are in charge of different business verticals. Um, in that way, you're learning the skill set from a number of different areas within a company, and that just uh, broadens your your knowledge. Um, if you don't have financial skills, get supplemental help, you know, do, do an MBA or do some kind of certificate program um, so that you can get that financial acumen that you need. Um, we, we talked a little bit, Amy did a good job of covering all of the other areas that, uh, that folks are looking for to fill those gaps within a board. And, and they're pretty extensive. I mean, I, when I was going through this process, I met a number of women uh, in my certificate program who uh, had no financial background at all. They were specialists in marketing or human capital or um, had some particular unique technical expertise. And um, I think nowadays uh, that's definitely something that's going to be useful to a board and something that you want to highlight as you're going through that process. But um, mm -hmm. other than just specific experience, I think you also need to start thinking about starting early building your brand. Um, we haven't really talked about that much yet, but it's very important when you get to the networking aspect of getting a um, directorship. Um, and you want to early on start to expand that network through social media, LinkedIn specifically, um, and, and go beyond what I'll call going beyond the edge of your network. Um, you want to, uh, to do that through a variety of different techniques with, which I think maybe, uh, Betsy might elaborate on in, in more mm -hmm. later. Thanks Katie. So Betsy, uh, sorry for making you wait so long to listen to all of us. <laughs> it's, it's great because it's been excellent information and then I can add a little bit to it. Exactly. So Betsy, um, full disclosure, and I are good friends. We've known one another for several years now. Uh, 2020 Women on Boards is a member of the coalition. Um, and I think we have a, you know, a mutual admiration uh, going on for each, for, for both of us. She's done an amazing job. I think you've been CEO of 2020 Women on Boards for what, a couple of years? Two years. And a half. I mean, they yeah. transformed the organization. Not that it wasn't already a great organization to start with, but uh, Betsy has has really um, extended herself and the organization to all of the women, and actually internationally as well as nationally. I believe in ninety days or something. Um, one of the things that she, you know, is, is known for being an executive uh, search. CEO um, is advice on how to do this. And so I know that you give workshops and you know we don't have time for that obviously, but people can join your workshops um, with, and we can give that information. But can you give us a primer, you know, highlights of your workshop and, and what, what you share with women and how to go about this, um, actually very challenging task that, that everybody wants to do, but you know, we all get frustrated because we hit a brick wall. So can you help us out and just give some of your pointers which come from a long road of experience and expertise? Well, thanks so much, Charlotte. It comes from um, 26 years owning a retained executive search firm and doing a lot of board searches along the way. Um, some of those related to seeking women candidates, and that's really what I focus on exclusively now. But uh, the building on what uh, Amy and Katie uh, talked about in terms of the, um, the, what seems like a long road really can be cut down into bite-sized pieces. And especially for those of you who are in your 30s, you can start on a nonprofit board and then move into looking at investing in a small way in private equity companies in your 40s and your 50s. And in your 50s is when we'd like to see you getting on. And most of you will think, well, I'll never be 50 years old. Well, it does happen. And then maybe <laughs> even 60 happens. 
uh, I know it's not a, I'm on the other side of that. So you, it's really, life is okay over here, but uh, you need to be planning <laughs> that you're going to, you're going to get there someday. So you may as well decide that you're going to be on corporate boards at that point. In your 50s is when you, late 50s even, is when you hope that your contacts, you will have worked for 20 years to get your contacts to think about you as a potential board candidate. So that you can be on the board for, you can be named to a public company board, a small one, and then grow with it, and then maybe get on another company, a public company board, and grow with that. And you might have, you might be on two or three um, before then you would retire, say, at 60 or 65. Now, and then stay on those boards or on, on uh, different boards, because as uh, the panelists have referred to, uh, companies like to have women or men who have had prior board experience. So in the bite-sized pieces, we cover this in our 2020 Women on Boards Get On Board workshop. We have one, uh, it's very short, but very succinct. We have one starting on Monday, as a matter of fact, August 17th, and we just do a two-hour session in the midday in California, lunchtime really, 11.30 to 1.30, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, two-hour session each day, and that's it. That's the end of the workshop. But then at that point, you will have a great deal of um, uh, individual focus. Each workshop is 20 people only. Individual focus on, on how you can maneuver your own networks and your own um, the strategies to get on a corporate board. So there are three for everybody on this phone, uh, on this webinar. There are three keys. And to synthesize what Amy and Katie mentioned, the first is really industry visibility. Katie was talking about building your brand. The best way to build your brand, simply build your brand, is in your visibility. In, I'm sorry, in your own industry. Even though you'd like to serve on a board in another industry, you're going to end up serving on your first board in your own industry. Why? Because that's where you have the most expertise and the most contacts. So you'll be on your first board likely in your, in your same industry. So you build your industry visibility by getting on the industry trade association board, for example, first. And you can do that in your 30s and your 40s. And you make the friends and the contacts there. So that's building your industry visibility is a key factor. And then during that visibility is when you become known to those people you meet uh, for your expertise. And Amy mentioned p &L responsibility, yes. Uh, but if you're also a CHRO, Chief Human Resources Officer, or if you are a cybersecurity expert, as she mentioned, or ESG, which means environment, social, and governance, and also under ESG falls uh, digital marketing, which younger people are, are men and women have a chance to uh, get on boards as digital marketing experts because the older guys do not know anything about it. And they want a board member who can give them counsel among their, their colleagues. And um, so that's an avenue. So you, you the, by building your industry visibility, these contacts will know what you're good at. And then the second key is getting prior board experience. We've all been talking about this. Prior board experience means nonprofit board experience or get on a state commission, which Fiona knows a lot about. And all of you on this call probably have heard about commissions in your city, county, and state. And those are the Parks and Rec Commission, the Police Commission, the Housing Commission. And the reason, especially if you're an attorney or somebody in a consulting firm who doesn't have a large PL, you can't get a large PL, work on a large PL if you don't have one. And those commissions, you suddenly get fiduciary responsibility for a multi-million dollar budget. And you have fiduciary experience, therefore, with a large P&L. And that helps to build your portfolio of experience. So get prior board experience. And the other, the other benefit of nonprofit board experience, it's really the biggest benefit, is building your network of contacts. Because 90, well, I can tell you specifically, 80% of the women in my book, and I interview 50, 53 women and their stories in this, this particular book, and then the first book was 58 women and how they got to their first corporate board. 80% of them were recommended by someone they knew on their nonprofit boards because the nonprofit board member had seen that woman in action. And to what Katie said earlier about uh, collegiality and fit, then somebody who might recommend you 
um, or might invite you to his or her board, uh, already has the sense of who you are and how you how you operate in the board environment. That's the best benefit of nonprofit boards. So yes, you're going to be on your child's school board. That's probably not where you're going to meet the person who's going to recommend you. Start to plan on getting on United Way board. Start in the committee at the United Way and get move up in the United Way or cancer or heart or um, uh, other boards that have uh, other senior corporate people on those boards so that you are very strategic about the connections that you're going to make by serving on those uh, the nonprofit boards. And then the last and the, the ultimate key is to develop that experience that specifically works toward and builds your credibility to be on either, and Amy referred to this, the Audit and Finance Committee or the Compensation Committee or the ESG committee, Environment, Social, and Governance, or Enterprise Risk, Katie referred to the management crisis management, and Amy referred to the financial crises that could happen and do happen with companies. So um, your, it, sometimes it's the, the entire board that's the Enterprise Risk Committee, or sometimes it is the, uh, a separate committee. But in your conversations about yourself, which what I call your high impact sound bites, you talk about your industry experience, your prior board experience, and your ability, your specific ability to serve on one of those four committees. And then when you're talking to somebody, they say, oh, this woman really knows what she's talking about. And there was a question in the chat about age, and let me just close with this. Um, the generally accepted retirement age for board members is 75. So I talked about getting on a board in your late 50s, certainly in your 60s. Because boards, even though um, shareholders would like to see shorter terms, and yes, they're, the board members are elected every year and voted in, and some are nominated every year, but really, the board members stay on for 10, 15 years. So if 75 is going to be the accepted age when you step down, you need to be certainly on a board by the time you're 60. Now, after you're 75, you can still be on those boards where you've been, and you certainly have valuable experience to bring to other boards, but it's most likely you'll move into private company boards at that point and take your public company experience into the private realm. And so you don't have to worry that you're gonna never be on a board again once you're 75. So thinking about that, thinking about your whole life and how you're gonna navigate your career to ultimately get on corporate boards is what we'd like to see. If there's any time left, I would tell you about the executive search process, but only if you want to hear that, Charlie. Sure. One of the things um, that, that I was thinking about as you were talking, Betsy, um, that I wish I had done, um, I was actually in Europe, in fertile ground in France, where quotas were established. And, you know, today some of our investors in Europe are not even focused on boards anymore because they, they, they have them. They're focused on senior leadership. But that's another story. You know, that's I don't have very many regrets, but one that I do have is not asking my CEO to help me. And maybe you could talk about that, about mentoring and sponsorship and, and how that works. I mean, you said earlier, we like men and we do, uh, most of them. How, how can they help us? Because I think that they are an intricate piece of this puzzle, uh, if you could address that. They are, they're very much part of the solution. So. Um, your first step in, um, in pursuing at, at the time when you think you're ready for a corporate board is to talk to your CEO. And if you happen to be the CEO, then you could give yourself permission to be networking. But if you work for a company and you have a CEO or senior leaders who serve on those nonprofit boards that we just mentioned, um, ask them, first of all, their, I hate to say it, but their permission to serve on outside public company boards. For years, Disney never allowed any of their men or women to serve on corporate boards. They could serve on nonprofits, but not on corporate boards because there is you know, the risk that a company will go bankrupt and then the Disney name might be sullied somewhat, but mainly they want all their executives to work 150% for Disney and no one else. So um, understood, and some of those CEOs of your companies might feel that way too but you can explain to them 
that just like they serve on boards, by the way, the Disney CEO served on boards himself for years and years, Bob Iger, um, served on Apple and still does, I think, and several other boards, but he wouldn't let his senior execs serve on boards. Uh, that's an aside. But uh, you, you also explain to your CEO why you want to serve on a corporate board. It will make you a better executive, a more well-rounded executive. And I almost forgot to mention the fact that board members are valued for a vast network of business contacts they may bring. And uh, I, Katie mentioned it too. Business Boards are looking for board members who can help grow their business, who can help expand their horizons. They're not looking for naysayers or or people who are going to, you know, tell them what not to do. That's why sometimes lawyers have a tough chance, a tough time trying to get on corporate boards because CEOs and board members think, well, that lawyer is just going to tell us what we cannot do. And uh, so a, a lawyer has to bring up, and there are probably many lawyers in this audience, a particular experience like real estate or digital or cybersecurity in order to bring a different value to the board. At any rate, it's important that the uh, the uh, the the, the value that you bring to that board is very much part of developing their business outreach. And um, that's, it's critically important, those contacts that you make. Yeah, so, so lastly, um, Betsy, one of the, um, you know, there is a lot of, so there's the demand, which I'll talk about that in a minute about what we're trying to do about that. But then um, how do you, do all of this. I mean, we've said, you know, make contacts and <laughs> do all of these things, you know, how do you go about doing it? And so my question is, um, actually, you, you offered to address it. I mean, one of the um, obvious, obvious ways of doing it is to be in touch with an executive search firm. And we have many throughout the, um, the country that, that are there and, you know, have theoretically wonderful board uh, programs, et cetera. My experience and, you know, has been that it's very difficult to go through a search firm. How do you, how do you get in that network? Um, and how do you get them to contact you down the road? I mean, my experience has been, if your resume happens to hit the desk when there's an active search and that consultant is there, you know, looking for candidates, then you may have a chance. If not, my experience, and hopefully it's changed a bit today, is that you kind of get lost in the shuffle and you know, mm -hmm. maybe you could address how is the best way to approach a search well, firm. The, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, not yours, but in general. All right. <laughs> um, it, to, um, to demystify the process uh, and uh, debunk the theory that search firms are the key, uh, search firms are not the key. Uh, here's an example. Interestingly enough, uh, I mean, the key is you, every one of you working your own networks from your own core group of 25 key contacts. They, those are the ones who are going to get you on corporate boards, not a search firm. And it's good also to put your resume on the, on the state treasurer's registry of uh, women who are interested in serving on boards. But here's what happens. Um, the search firms, and I know because I am one, and there's Hybrid and Struggles and Corn Ferry and Russell Reynolds and, and um, Spencer Stewart, big big firms in the in the industry who add on board searches for their clients. Um, we we are generally hired by the uh, board and given a list of the nine to thirteen people that the company and the nominating committee, the board, already knows and loves. And the assignment to the search firm is to vet these candidates, meaning look at their other board background, what boards do they serve on, are there any conflicts of interest, what is their schedule, what is their general reputation in the, in the industry. They also want to know, and this is interesting women, they also want to know has that woman or that candidate ever fired a CEO before? They don't want to bring on somebody on the board who's had the experience of firing the CEO before. Amy mentioned the job of the board is to manage that CEO and also fire him or her if, uh, if that CEO is not doing a great job. So uh, is that interesting of what they want the search firms to do? And then the search firms give a verbal report back to the nominating committee. And that the, uh, we always say, all the search firms say, well, gee, in addition to this list, 
May we also seek out women and people of color who meet the experience uh, the criteria that you're looking for. The answer is always yes. They would never say no, but they don't really mean it. And when you br do bring additional women and people of color forward with excellent career background, maybe even better, certainly equal if not better than some of the other uh, resumes that have been put forward by the board themselves, they don't have a chance unless they already know somebody on that corporate board. Now, this is a very general rule, of course. Now, the reason why is because board searches are very confidential and they're because boards are built on relationships of trust, collegiality, and that those board members want to know that this person has good judgment, good business judgment, and that he or she is going to be somebody if there's a crisis. They can really depend on this person to bring valuable experience and guidance to the board. So there are lots of um, uh, criteria that are really important to being a board member. It's uh, not just uh, gender representation. So with that, uh, I'll close with, <laughs> when the law passed, SB 26, two years ago, I thought there was gonna be quite a, quite a rush on board searches and hiring retained executive search firms. Well, there wasn't. And the re responsibility of companies was to add a woman and 200 women were added in the year 2019, as I mentioned. How did they find those women? Through their CPA firms, their bankers and their law firm. And so they call up the CPA firm, the banker, the law firm, law firm, CPA, banker, and, and say, Joe, we got to find a woman for our board. We don't want a woman, but we don't, we don't know one. Whom do you know who would fit into our collegial environment and really bring, bring business strength to us? And the majority of recommendations, the majority of women who got on boards last year were recommended by the companies that I just mentioned. Could be retire, retired partner, et cetera. And uh, then also through nonprofit networks. And, um, and Katie, I'm not quite sure, you, you had a very proactive search on your, on your own, but, um, and I don't know if you were selected by a search firm, but this is how the real, the real world works, uh, women and men in the audit. So I wanted you to just know that your key contacts, your own contacts, and you're telling your contacts that if you're interested to serve on corporate boards and your valuable experience that you would bring, why? Why would they want you? You have to identify the valuable experience you would bring. Um, that will be what gets you on corporate boards. So it's very interesting, but definitely get your registry, your, your resume on, on the treasurer's uh, registry because somebody might look at that list who is looking for a uh, board member with your experience just might so it's worth definitely being there well, on the other way there was another question about how do we find boards you said uh, how do you find boards that that are looking you can't you can look at our 2020 women on boards research which is 3,000 companies throughout the u.s and you can filter by california and you can see which companies have how many women on their boards and you can then see a company that you might like, not the big ones, but smaller or medium ones, and go to their websites and see how many women they have on their boards. And then seek out people who might know those people in order to get yourself recommended. But board searches are very confidential. And why? Because uh, CEOs and boards don't want the Wall Street Journal or anybody else who might make public the board members or candidates they might be considering could affect the stock price, could get some activists riled up. Uh, they, they, there are very important business reasons why board searches are held very close to the vest. So we'll never change that. And we don't have to change that. It's just a matter that you, we women, need to know how to work our own networks in order to be recommended. Thanks, Betsy, for that. Well, we've covered a, a, an enormous <laughs> lots today. Are there any like closing comments that Amy, you or, or Katie would like to, to add before before we close? Um, well, I'll go ahead and, and just, uh, I, I noticed in some of the questions that there was some interest in exactly how I landed my board position. So I'll try and be brief, but um, you know, I, I think it, it followed very much the outline that we've described here. It was a very long process. Um, 
I had identified serving on a corporate board as a goal in my 30s, um, started serving on the local community boards, a citywide HOA, um, industry sector boards, including women in public finance, which is represented here. Hi, everyone. And, um, and finally, nonprofits. Um, I also utilized uh, trying to find leadership roles within my own firm. And, uh, you know, we mentioned a little bit about getting to know your CEO. I was fortunate enough to be um, picked to be the founding co-chair of our DNI Council at Piper Sandler, where I was really able to um, hone my leadership skills, get to know our CEO. Um, one of my, my mentors is uh, now the president of our company and a woman. Um, she's been, you know, just so instrumental in my uh, building up my leadership uh, within the firm. And um, of course, my investment banking background gave me the financial skill set, which of course is a, is a minimal requirement. But when I really got serious about getting on a corporate board and I set that intention that I wanted to get it done within a certain period of time. And, and frankly, it was when, um, when SB uh, 826 came out uh, and I thought, wow, this is my window of opportunity. I really need to get on this. I I built my resume, um, I'd worked on my branding. Now I needed to go that next step and, and have a plan. And I started that part of the journey by getting some additional uh, corporate board training uh, via a certification through the UCLA Women in Governance Program. Um, there are a multitude of programs that are available out there at various cost ranges and time commitments. Um, and they generally cover um, you know, a number of different areas about, you know, the characteristics of a board member, et cetera, probably a lot of what you could get through Betsy's program. Um, but it, it, it was really a great experience uh, from, from the standpoint of getting that additional expertise. Uh, I'm not sure the certificate itself is, uh, is like getting an MBA, but it did introduce me to a host of other very amazing, talented women that I never would have met otherwise from a variety of different industries from across the US. Um, it did give me access to recruiters and a database for networking. And I really kind of looked at the cost as being an investment in myself. Um, and, and frankly, my first board Mark. check covered that uh, and then some. And then based on the guidance that I got from that certification program, I started to enhance my resume, um, you know, updating my CV and my bio, um, lo looking specifically at LinkedIn and my social media platform and the branding. Uh, again, there's a lot of online and membership services that can help you navigate that. Um, and, and again, folks on, on this webinar that can help you in that respect, uh, really critical there. And then once I got all of that established, um, that's when the interesting part of the journey started and that was the networking and i have to say you know they say you have to be 95 percent prepared and that is absolutely true but um probably the most difficult part for me was the networking because i'm just as a woman not really comfortable asking people for favors but once i had um the certification and the updated bios and linkedin profile in in hand i really set my intention to to look at my networking list, come up with a short list of contacts, um, hone in on who those contacts were. And in my case, I was not looking for friends and family, surprisingly. I was looking for those people in my immediate network who either were board members or had access to board members or could refer me to board members. Um, and then I created an ask. And, and that was probably the most difficult thing for me, but you know, nobody's gonna reach out and look at you as a candidate if they don't know you're looking. And so um, you, you really need to be bold about that ask. And if you're prepared, then you know, people should be very willing to, to look at you as a candidate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and probably you know, most importantly, um, be prepared, and, and I think this goes you know, early on in the process, um, to actively look for ways to help others within your network achieve their goals first. Um, and I always ask 
folks when, when I ask for something from them, is there anything that I can do for you? Uh, and, and of course, be prepared to follow up with that as well, because, um, you know, generally the people that are in your network, uh, particularly your business network, they're there for, to network. They're there to, to see and to use their network to assist in finding opportunities, helping others, et cetera. So, so you shouldn't be, you know, hesitant about doing that. Just, just be bold. Um, funny story, uh, you know, I, I was very prepared for this to be a very long process. And um, as I said, I started really seriously in 2019. Um, my certification program was in June. Um, I probably, you know, I finished that and got my CV and bio and all of that ready pretty shortly after I finished the program, maybe within a month. And then I started my networking list. And the first person that I called was a gentleman who, um, I had known for years, he was a, a neighbor, lived next door. We weren't very close, but I knew that he was a, had, had been a CEO. I call him a roving CEO because he had one of those positions where he'd go to a company pre-IPO, work there as their CEO. And then once they went to the IPO that he'd move on to the next company. And I, I thought, well, you know, gee, he's going to know a lot of people that are on boards and then he might be in a position to, uh, to, to refer me. And so um, I called him and asked him if he wanted to sit down for lunch. He agreed to do that. I must have spent a week before the lunch super preparing to, to give him all the reasons why I would be a valuable director and, and what my expertise was and where I'd served before, et cetera. And we met for lunch. We sat down, spent about five minutes just chit-chatting, get, getting caught up. And then I started to go into my you know, prepared remarks on why I was good, going to be a good director. And he, he laughed and he stopped me and said, I know you're qualified. I have your resume. Let's talk about who I can refer you to. And so I guess the message there was, you know, you definitely have to be prepared, but once you're prepared, it is about the relationship. It's about the networking. He went on to refer me to um, several different individuals, one of which was general counsel for the company that I eventually was offered a position at. So uh, once those connections were made, um, it was a fairly quick process and I was voted in in November of 19. So, uh, you know, it, I think that process of honing right. down the network of folks that you're talking to and, and networking with and actually asking for that role is, is super important. And it, and it doesn't necessarily need to be those closest people around you. You need to, to think about going outside of the box. Well, great Thank story, you, Katie. if I could even add, and, and our 2020 um, uh, workshop, 2020 Women on Boards, provides that background as well. You have a great story, Katie, great story. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all. Before turning it back over to the treasurer, just I'd like to say that I'm optimistic. You know, I know that <laughs> it's really hard and it's hard to get started, the process, but you know, on the other side of that, we are really, really putting pressure on companies and we're doing it in a collaborative way, but they are feeling that pressure outside of California. California is special because there, there are some you know, laws in place that push that along, but I have never seen our investor base so energized to, to really push this forward for women and people of color. I think the day has come. You know, this is a time where we all have had an incredible year, a lot of, um, unfortunately pain and suffering to get here. But I think there's a window open today and that we, we have to go through it and we'll go through it together. Um, and with that, I'll turn the floor back over to Treasurer Mark with some closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, Charlotte, and to all the panelists. And as I was listening to all of you and all of your tips and your stories, it's very similar to running for office by the way. And, you know, when we try to recruit uh, women to run for office, they always have to think about it, right? They have to go back and, and check in with their families and question whether they're qualified and, you know, talk to a lot of people. Yet when uh, there is an open position, the men are always like, pick me, I'm ready. They don't check in with anyone. Uh, none of this, you know, self-assessment. Um, and so I think it's, it's very, very important. And thank you, Betsy, we're talking about, you know, age also. Um, I'm 54 years old. And when I turned 50, I actually felt like free, right? 
Uh, I've done so much in my life. I finally have confidence. I don't need to check in with anybody. You get to a point where you're just like, I can do it. Uh, and so it's great to hear that we have a life on corporate boards, maybe till 75 or 85 years old, because I think all of us think about what is our next stage uh, in our careers, in our life? What can we do to give back uh, and to be useful? Uh, and I do think, thank you, Charlotte, for mentioning that this is an opportunity. Uh, the fact that, you know, Joe Biden committed to picking a woman as a vice president. I mean, that excited me. You know, having someone, a man at the highest level say, I am committed to do this. And I don't know if that excited you, but that excites me. And that's what it's going to take. Like all of you said, we need mentors. We need people who are going to pull us up. Uh, we need to do the networking, the self-assessment, building our resumes, uh, and we are all capable uh, and, um, you know, have the ability to be appointed to all corporate boards. But I really want to thank Catherine for her soft skills assessment, because that is very important, right? Whether you fit in uh, to a board, um, whether you um, have really looked at your own um, you know, collegiality, empathy, uh, resilient perspective, cachet, valuable relationships, network, skilled governance, and whether you're a cultural fit. I think that is the most uh, important thing that we all have to think about. And when you're looking for that company or that board, do you also fit into that mission and vision, right? And that I think goes a long way. So I saw all of the chats here today and people were like, this is amazing. This has been so valuable. Thank you so much. They want to know, Betsy, when your corporate board trainings are so that they can sign up. Uh, they want to know whether they can see and view this presentation at a later date, Charlotte. So I think we recorded it. So we will. Yes, we have. Available. Yes. Uh, Gloria and, is taking care of that. Yes. Uh, Kath, uh, um, Kathy, they wanted to know what your uh, certificate program was uh, so that, that you mentioned. Um, and again, I just thank all of you for your time. Oh, and my corporate registry. Basically, I have just been compiling resumes and I will be passing them on uh, to uh, those of you who are uh, in the business of uh, trying to recruit and find qualified women um, that's where I started, and we really need more trainings like this so that we can ensure that the people who want to be on a board are ready to be on a board. And you all provided such amazing insights uh, to this process, and I thank you all for your time. And I know this won't be the last time we are going to talk. But thank you again, Charlotte, for all you're doing, um, making sure that we level the playing field and to all of you for your experience and sharing your stories. Um, again, everybody has said this is an amazing program. So we really thank you for your time uh, and educating us on this process. Thank you. Thanks, everybody everyone. go for it. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go no for it. Do the work. Go for it. Go for it. I right. add that uh, our, our, our workshops are listed on the <clears throat> website 2020, that's the year 2020, wob.com under events and, and educational programs. And there's one coming up on Monday. Right. And, I, and I shared it in the notes, but um, I attended the UCLA Women in Governance program, and I believe they have another one coming up, although I believe it's going to be virtual uh, in the fall. Okay, Great. Amy, any okay. programs you've got coming up? Workshops, boards? I have a bunch of resources that I'm happy to share with folks. I've got a top 10 due diligence list because the one thing I worry about being a governance person is just because someone asked you to be on a board, it might not be the right board. So be careful what you wish for. Sometimes you want to, it's sometimes in our eagerness, we're just like, yes, let me take that job or that thing. And so, you know, you deserve to do your own questioning as well to, to Katie's point. So I've got like a top 10 list on that and some other free resources that I'm happy to send out. If people want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'll have my assistant send those out. Good. And Charlotte, we're going to do another training together. We are. We are. We're going to we're going to help companies diversify their boards because I do think they need help. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I do think that most of them are trying. Uh, so 
with the treasurer and a, and a good friend of mine, James White. We're going to have another webinar taking them through the process from the very beginning of how to how to get to the point of having women and people of color on their boards. So I'm really excited about that. That's on September the 29th. Great. Well, and we also have our, if I may, our global broadcast, 2020 Women on Boards uh, globally throughout the world on November 12th. And then we follow with 30 events in the key cities around the country. And that includes Sacramento, San Francisco, LA, Orange County, and San Diego, all on the, the week of November 16th and the week after Thanksgiving, which is the first week in November. And it's gonna be quite a year, all virtual of course, but quite a year for everybody. I thank you, Treasurer Ma, for all you've done to advance our, our, our mission together, all of us. And uh, yeah. you're, you're helping to make a great deal of progress. Thank you, and so we are fun. all in this together. And I just wanna remind people, we have four W's in my office. It is wear your mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, and we are all in this together. So please stay safe. I thought you were gonna say we are all women. And <laughs> we will talk again soon. So again, uh, thank you all for your time. Really appreciate it. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take care.